live from New York. It's a show that hasn't seen an eclipse since Brew was in fifth grade. That's what he said. <laughs> and what was his reasoning for I was it? exaggerating. I've been working. He <laughs> said <laughs> You, you guys were kids when I started working. That's true. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. I don't even know if Nick was What's born. What's it have to do with this? Look, Nick he just glanced at the sky. Look, look. You see one eclipse? You kind of seen them all. I mean, <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> Today, is there drama in Dallas? And is there a snowball's chance that the Cowboys trade oh, Micah what? Parsons? It's exactly what I had written here. What? <laughs> Meanwhile, Bronny declares for the draft. What does this mean for the James family and the Lakers family? And finally, it's Monday Mock Draft 2.0. Does that mean better? We're not sure. It just means no. Another fresh <laughs> and updated edition of Nick's draft predictions alongside uh, Chris Broussard, who hasn't seen an eclipse. I'm in about to go during the break. 45 years. 45 you guys months. are telling me it's so <laughs> great. I mean, there. it's nice. Okay. It's Nick, right? Yeah. Nick, your take on the eclipse and your mock draft. Oh, I mean, you're going to see a once-in-a-lifetime thing today and the eclipse. Okay. <laughs> so Because next Monday it's 3.0. Exactly right. We start with South Carolina, Iowa. Dawn Staley squad take home the championship. Caitlin Clark ends her career with 38-5 and five in mm. the loss. Here's Caitlin after the game. The emotions will probably hit me over the next couple days, and I don't have much time to, you know, sit around and sulk and be upset and I don't think that's what I'm about either is you know yeah I'm sad we lost this game but I'm also so proud of myself I'm so proud of my teammates I'm so proud of this program the biggest thing is you know it's really hard to win these things um, I think I probably know that better than most people by now and to be so close twice it, it definitely hurts but at the same time like you know we were right there we battled back-to-back 30-point -back championship games mm. Brew. Without a championship, is Caitlin Clark still in the GOAT conversation? She's on the periphery. She's on the periphery because of what she's accomplished. The impact on the game, but she's not the GOAT. It's only fair, all right? It's only fair when we have quarterback in the NFL, college male player, NBA player, rings come into play. You're not in the conversation without a ring. Mm -hmm. Dan Marino. Some say the best they've ever seen Sling. Way ahead of his time. Yeah. No ring. As good as much respect as we give Marino, we kind of scoff at the notion of could he be the GOAT? Even Aaron Rodgers with just one ring, we say not written, he can't be in the conversation. Sure. So I I don't, she's not the GOAT. I can't, I gotta be fair with what we usually judge by. Now I've said. Last week, she's the best I've ever seen. I'm not so, watching all the players, but, but some people would say Marino was the best they ever saw. But again, I think your accomplishments have to support a GOAT argument. I say Patrick Mahomes. We all say he's the best I've ever seen, but I would say not yet. He's not the GOAT just yet. So, And I also think this. There are so many players in women's basketball that have won two three, or even four rings. And some, a lot of them obviously went to UConn and Tennessee, and some would say, well, yeah, they went to these powerhouses. Yeah. But you also could look at it like they also sacrificed individual stats. Well, now, had they gone to a school a where take. they were the show, they could have put up that's big numbers. So I, There's no one from UConn in the top ten in scoring. Hmm. Maya Moore is 11. Shamika yep. Holeslaw from Tennessee is 12, is, is 12. There's no one from Tennessee in the top 10. So I, I can't put her – she can be in the conversation because of the impact, but she, she's not the good. Okay, so that last point you made I actually totally agree with, which is there's a trade-off in everything in life. There's sports and accomplishments and GOAT talk included, which is had she been on a better team, she almost assuredly would not have all these right, same right, records. Right. You know what I mean? There, because she wouldn't have been the folk, the entirety yeah. of the offense, uh, all of it. But I also think because it is a team game and the context of everyone's context is different. Like it is easy to make the argument, well, it's Brianna Stewart, guys. 
She has four titles, right. three players of the year, and her last three years at UConn, they were 116 and one. That's not what more would you like? Well, and 117. Then, right, no. right, but then, <laughs> so they were her last three years, they were 116 right. and one. But then you get the context of, oh, so what happened to them after she left? The very next year that they left, UConn was 36 and 0, headed to the Final Four right. and lost in overtime. The year after that. They were 36-0, and headed to the Final Four, and lost in overtime. So even without her, those two teams went 72-2. and yeah, And right. so that is the context of it, which is why, to me, there is an eye test element of this because I agree with you on pro sports, Brew, that if you are ringless in a career, that seems like how could you be the best. But, but when you, you think about the you, best college player ever. The, uh, on the it, men's side, it's, rings, on right? the men's side, it's easy. I don't think there is a definitive answer on the women's side. I don't. Like I, Cheryl Miller is the one I've always said because I'll be totally honest. Because I was told, right? You know what I mean, right. because every people, I, I, it's hard to go back and research women's basketball in the '80s. Right. But you made up, the, you made the great point that someone else in that discussion was her teammate on those teams in, in uh, at USC Cooper, and Cynthia she Cooper. Had the McGee sisters, and, and so, yeah. the, so to me. I would like to just do a thought exercise for a moment because the only reason South Carolina is not the three-time defending national champions on a wooden Bruins-esque 82-game winning streak right now is because she beat them. Well, so, no, maybe. But, what do you mean? Because they might they, 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 then they would have had to beat LSU. Beat that's them. fair. Yeah, okay, I mean, but the, I, it, so you're, that's true because that wasn't the championship right. game. Point I'm making is, in a weird way, I think her beating South Carolina last year hurt her standing in some people's eyes in the GOAT argument. Because if it was just no one could win a title, there was this juggernaut program mm -hmm. that won 80 straight games, that won three straight championships, yep. that did all this stuff. And she, you know where her season ended? When she played them, you know, each year. But the, instead, she beat them once, and then they didn't have enough left in the tank to beat LSU. I, the other question I would have for you guys is this. And at what point, I know you guys didn't like my, if, she, if someone averaged 60 a game question. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But this is not a hyperbole. This is, re, I, I think it's real if you guys agree with it. The only player on Iowa that would be in the rotation for South Carolina that would have been on the court for them yesterday was Caitlin Clark. So at some point, I mean, like, I, 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 that's not definitive, but but you can for having watched the game, yeah, you, you know what I mean. Again, having watched the game, watched the tournament, that's what I feel. And so I guess my point is, I'm not sitting here saying she's the greatest college right. women's player ever because I don't feel that I am educated enough on the history and, to and, know yeah, that. I, I feel similar, but. I've been watching it pretty closely since Shamiqua Holds Claw, since I was a little kid and went to with Final Four in Kansas City. I was like, this is dope. And so Kathy Jolly and that Shamiqua Holds Claw team, all the UConn teams, I can't say that I think Tarazi was better than her. I can't say that I think Brianna Stewart was better than her. I've watched it, and I can't say that I think anyone that I've seen is better than so, her. No, I think but, that's for, Here's the other thing, though. Cheryl Swoops, who obviously is an all-time great, yeah. she did go to a program that wasn't Tennessee or Connecticut. She went to Texas Tech, led them to a championship. So I'm, I just think, in, in for me, being consistent, being yeah. fair with how I do men, I got to, I can't say she's a go. So, all right, she can so be in the discussion. NBA draft, WNBA draft is next week. Caitlin's going to go number one to Indiana Fever. Diana Taurasi was on with Van Pelt and kind of predicted what she was going to do next. Okay. And her quote is, uh, look, SV SVP, Van Pelt, reality is coming. There's levels to this thing. That's just life. We all went through it. You know, you look superhuman against 18-year-olds, but now you're playing against grown women. And the Phoenix Mercury are already sort of touting this matchup. Taurasi yeah. versus Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark. Cooked by Caitlin Clark. Maybe not prime Tarazi Wooden. What? Well, Tarazi's 41 years right, old. Right. So which maybe. is no. She's definitely going to get. Can I oh, say something about this? Go about ahead. The, the. I, I have massive respect. Massive. Like Tarazi, I saw a lot of people were talking Maya Moore and uh, Brittany Griner's name came up. It, prior to Caitlin Clark, Diana Tarazi was the best women's basketball player I've ever yeah. seen. She doesn't have the numbers Breonna Stewart or Maya Moore. Uh, right. To me, she was the best I had ever she's seen. Great. Her career's unbelievable. I really like Sue Bird. And I think what they, their telecast is awesome. 
They were doing some not so low key hating on Caitlin Clark. Well, there's been a lot of for that the going on. right, but this was a UConn thing. This was a Paige Beckers should be getting this moment. Caitlin's getting it, and you saw it. And I know you're like again. You can have respect for the athlete and the player, and then also recognize some of the commentary. I think is colored by their own school affiliation. And I don't know what you think, Brew. I do not think Caitlin Clark's going to go to the WNBA next year and struggle. No, I, I think uh, she's going to eat it up. Yes. She's okay. going to go crazy in that league. I, and I do. and she, 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 like I said last week, she is the best I've seen, but I can't give her the GOAT status. Okay. I'm not sure that, and I, I see some people like, ah, oh, if you're, I think it was LeBron. It's like, if you're hate, I mean, there's a certain amount of, if you're hating on Caitlin Clark, mm-hmm. that is out of bounds and obviously there's no place for it. If you are saying Paige is better than Caitlin Clark and we're going to ride with our UConn Huskies and she's going to come into the WNBA and I can't wait and we're putting ads up, I think that is doing – that is exactly what oh, women's I basketball totally, in WNBA yeah, needs. Hold on. To be clear, like somebody said, oh, man, women's basketball has now got to the point to where it's all a GOAT debate. And like, and we're doing it obviously it now. Be Can I just say something that's actually – that once, <laughs> your, once your sport has graduated to the silliest conversations, it yeah. actually means it is crossed it's over. Great. But you, I, you are right. It, That'll be it, great for the league. And, and I just want to – because maybe I spoke, said it weird. Well, because I'm, I, I also – now I need to defend. You're, you're, so I want to make it clear. I don't think – what Diana said was out of bounds. I think it was a sports take. Yeah, and you right. know what's also in bounds? Me saying that's a bad take. Oh, right. uh, you know what I mean? I take. think that was. I, mean, <laughs> I think. I think that that's. A, I think that's the right. idea I that, that, she, she's that not Paige play is well. better than Caitlin, and that Caitlin's not going to walk into the WNBA and immediately be one of the 20 best players in that league. 20. I, I hope I so. I think she'll be I, better no, than 20. I no, think she'll I, be one of the top 10. I do too, but that, their Easy. commentary was she's about she's about to be playing with grown women and she's going to struggle. And I'm saying I disagree. I think that is a fair take, yeah. but a bad take. Yeah, she, That's she, all. She's Maybe a little Wembenyama-esque, like start off a little slow and then get it halfway through the year. And uh, I, 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 just think it's, she, I think she's going to play tremendous. I think she's going to immediately be one of the best players in the league. I, okay. I do too. All right, be good. Yeah. Uh, Dawn Staley. Wins her third championship in seven years, undefeated season. She's 109 and three in her last three seasons. Let's take a look at her resume. Win percentage, 901. Finals four, six national titles, three. So what's next? Scott Fowler of the Charlotte Observer says Staley's next challenge should be coaching the Charlotte Hornets. Actually, seems like a bit of a punishment. But it's an interesting <laughs> idea. Uh-huh. Nick, your reaction. All right, I, first, I want to. I've had the pleasure of being able to meet and talk with Dawn Staley a couple times in my life. She's like one of those people that, at least for me, you almost makes you nervous being around. Like you don't want to like you want to impress them. Like she just carries a real presence. Like this is the first time I met you, bro. Like I. <laughs> the, um, but I just want to give. She took over in '09, and they were 10 and 18 her first year. Mm. They didn't win their first SEC championship for five years in 2014. And, man, once she got it rolling, yep. 2017, she, or 2015, she makes her first Final Four, 2017, the national championship. 2020, they would have won it, I believe. The pandemic canceled the tournament. They were, I think, 32-1, and one, and they don't get a tournament. You know what I mean? And now she could have won three in a row and has won two of the last three, which is to say all, everything else she does at South Carolina's gravy. And I understand people saying the Charlotte Hornets should do it. I wonder why the University of Kentucky wouldn't call Mm -hmm. on the men's side of things. Mm. So that is a Mm. program where Patino won, Tubby won, Coach Cal won. And I look at the NBA and some of the best coaching jobs. I think she could do it because I don't – people are like, ah, are people going to listen to, you know, a woman telling them how to – like, I don't think the Timberwolves are like Chris Finch really got down at his, D, you know what I mean, D3 basketball or, or <laughs> Dagenau. Not a D3 catch. Our you friend, know of, the sh- right, our friend yeah. of the show, Danny Parkins, just wrote a book, Pipeline to the Pros, about how so many of the guys that are head coaches or GMs were D3 basketball players. I bet a lot of men's players respect her playing career more than somebody that played, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, like Jeff Van Gundy's playing career or things like that. So I think she could do it. I just think her ability to relate to young people – and the recruiting and the molding is so special on the collegiate level that I would think the next challenge might be go go get Kentucky back to glory rather than the 
the hamster wheel that is the NBA, which is like, yeah. how, how can you succeed in Charlotte? Like, Michael Jordan tore that thing down so poorly <laughs> and left the cupboard so bare. We're done with like, the gold just, I'm just right, saying. Right. All right, go ahead. Sorry. No, look, I like the Kentucky idea. I, I think that makes some sense. And a lot of people, like you said, whether it's the NBA or men's college players may say, well, will they listen to a yeah. woman? Will they let her be an authority? Look, in the NBA, their last two CEOs of the Players Association, which the players choose, have been women. Oh, yeah. So they're showing that they will listen to the authority of a woman. So if I'm either of these, I'm not just giving her the job, but I would love to talk to her if I'm them. So let, let me go to Charlotte. Definitely I will put her on the list and talk to her. But I don't think – look. Most guys that have come from college to coach the NBA have not succeeded. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about guys that won Calipari, yeah. Rick Patino, Jerry Tarkanian. Yeah. You know, you can go, and then there's other, those Brad's, are the ones Brad that Stevens have won, won. one champion. Who? Brad Stevens won. Brad's. Brad Stevens okay, did a good yeah, job, and he, Billy he Donovan, did a good job. okay. Billy like, Donovan, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. But no, yeah. they haven't won a championship. But most, most haven't. I mean, we could Mike Montgomery yeah. and, and, you know, Lon mm -hmm. Kruger and guys like So it's a tough jump. So if I were the Hornets, I might put her on the list. But, no, I'm not, like, def just giving her the job. I, I think that's crazy. So, I, But I would Kentucky is a good, is a good uh, situation for her. But you, I don't like either of them. You just I, want her to stay? I want her to stay. I think what makes college sports interesting is the churn of players and the consistency of coaches and, that's pro fair. and programs. Right? So it's like Calhoun has been at UConn for 39 years. So it's like he's oh, – Calhoun, I'm sorry. Gino's been at, at Calhoun UConn. was there. Calhoun has also been there. Yeah. Sorry, Gino's been there yeah. for 39 years. So I like the idea no, of her just being the anchor yep. of South Carolina. They're always there. The players – she had new starting and, five this I mean, this, this year. is – it's not going to – like what we have seen particularly in the women's game is you can have a decade-plus run of running it. You know what I yeah, mean? Oh, Pat yeah. Summit ran the game for yeah, my from entire Summit youth. To Gino. Right, and then Gino ran it on yep. a level even higher than Pat did for the better part of 15 years, yep. and now she appears to be at the beginning of yep. that to where it could keep going. That's right. for sure. No, now I we'll do. talk about UConn. Uh, yeah. Purdue versus UConn, me versus Dusty tonight. Start to think Jim Calhoun, system coach. Everybody wants a UConn. <laughs> <laughs> system <laughs> coach. Uh, Huskies are six and a half point favorite over Dusty's Boilermakers. Brew, what are the chances that Purdue pulls off the upset? I, I gotta say this first, though. I mean, and we we talked. Dusty is so melancholy. I mean, I don't leave know, him alone. I he's, see no he's confidence. So nervous. I see guys. no confidence Zero. whatsoever. Dusty's our in big him. Purdue fan. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. sad. But anyway, I give him a twenty-five to thirty percent chance. Wow. Twenty-five to thirty. Yeah, which I think seven and a half. Yeah, about that. Okay. Now, I think the key. Is they they are what their their formula is? They got the big man, obviously Zach Eady inside, and they shoot it well from three. They're one of two teams in the nation that shot forty percent yep. from three. So obviously the key is Eady's got to punish them inside to the point where you have to double him, and that's then they got to hit those threes. Now that's the thing because because they got clinging with UConn who's seven two, so he should at least be able to match up somewhat with Eady. So. I think it's going to be a challenge, but if they can, if Edie can play well inside and they can hit their threes at a high level, you guys then I'll like give 50 them a shot. Maybe. The, so the, I mean, look, we've seen I've seen stranger things happen. Yeah, but the, okay. and this is also this is dope because the, we don't. It's pretty rare, actually, especially in modern the last 20 years of college basketball to get the pretty clear-cut two yeah. best teams throughout right. the year yep. to be able to play in the Final Four. I mean, if people watch this show regularly, whenever we would do our college basketball promos, like back in November or December, Wilds would be jo joking but serious about UConn or Purdue kind of toggling that one and two rating back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it is a cool matchup because it will give – Young people, a bit of an idea of what professional basketball used to look like. Yeah, I like it. You know, where, <laughs> where, where it, the focal point is a dominant big man is what I mean. You know what I mean? To where yeah. the I understand. I, I it's I'm not. It, it's not exactly a perfect right. comp, oh, but like it's just they play through, they, they play through a seven footer yeah. that they're gonna live or die with. I do. I am curious what. UConn is going to – how they're going to react to their big guy not being the biggest guy on the court for Good the challenge. only game they've played like that all year. And I want Purdue to win, 
because I want Dusty to be happy and I want Wilds to feel pain. But I, <laughs> but I, I also can't get past this. UConn's not just 11 and 0 in their last 11 tournament games. Yeah, they have covered yeah. 11 straight spreads. Oh, you love that. Well, it's impossible, and the fact that I have not made a dollar off it is just <laughs> maddening. In fact, I think I bet against them a couple times last year. Why did you do that? Last time? year, last before year. the and so I, this, you've been you've been saying all year that no one can come Correct. close to UConn. Yes, and I'm rooting against you, but I think you're so right. So we think Zach Eady's going to get his. I think it's going to be very similar to what we just saw with Iowa. Like, oh, you have one star player; mm-hmm. they're going to get theirs. But maybe if we can slow down everybody else, you're going to have a hard time really ratcheting it up. Um, I have two things. One, do you remember LeVar Ball? Yeah, I do. <laughs> do we remember? Do you remember LeVar Ball? Wasn't that long He said ago. something famous. He said, uh, never lost. Yeah. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Five, well, and, five and 0. Well, UConn's 5 and 0 in championship games. So this will be our sixth title. That's impressive. And then uh, this tournament, UConn's starting five. So who do you want to stop here? If your game plan is, I'm, who do you want? Like, you know what? I mean, Kling. Let's put the brakes. Okay. They want to get Klingon in foul trouble. But every, that's the idea. Everybody, everybody scores. scores. No, I think Castle's the best NBA prospect. Yes. No, but they. But don't He's you think Newton's gonna go? Don't yeah. you think yeah. that the the recipe for Purdue is this? Is that we are nearing the under twelve timeout and Klingon picks up his second foul? So and late. I, I, I mean, that's on the board. And and definitely they, yeah, on the board. I'm not what saying you you, right. I'm yes. saying if you're Purdue, even if Absolutely. there are some empty possessions early, you are. I think the goal has to be to not only play through Edie, but drive it Klingon and see if you because he's going to be under so much pressure to defend Edie. Yeah. And then if all of a sudden he has to defend softer, that's when Edie can really I, take advantage. Like that's just what I think because UConn is clearly the better team. You're it's, right about that. It's an that. odd refereeing. Um, I know assignment. Like, like, you got to think of those two big guys, like, let them play a little bit. I agree. It, it, I agree. Don't let UConn get – the refs decide another UConn. <laughs> Don't get me started. John Calipari leaving Kentucky, finalizing a five-year deal with the Razorbacks. Coach Cal, 15 years at UK, went from great to good. First six years, oh, four Final Fours and a 2012 championship with AD. Last nine years, no Final Fours and losses to Oakland and St. Peter's. Bro, your reaction. Well, I was one of those that thought Kyle should have got fired after after this year's tournament. And I think this works out for all three parties, for Kyle, for Kentucky, and for Arkansas. For Kyle, whoo, even though they brought him back, it was going to be ugly with those fans. It was ugly last year. It was toxic there last year with the fans and Kyle. And this year would have been even worse. So he needed to get out of that situation. All right. The only reason they kept him, I think, was because he had $33 million left if they fired him. So for Kentucky, you get to get rid of him, which they probably wanted to do. And then you're not on the hook for that money. And for Arkansas, which has still been a good – Eric Musselman did a good job there. This year they struggled. But for the most part, he did a good job. But – Kyle is just on a different level from Musselman in terms of college basketball. And so I think he brings a panache. He probably brings the type of recruits they haven't had in mass since Nolan Richardson was there, yeah, yeah. like NBA caliber, you know, players in the future. Corliss and so walking through that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Scotty yeah. Thurman, yeah. Scotty yeah. Thurman, whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, so I, I think this takes him to another level, gives him a shot in the yeah. arm. And so I like it for all three. Classic two for Colin Cowherd. Oh, I don't know. He's you're been out on. Classic two hey, well, for my, for my, you know, dear friend and mentor, Cowherd, I'll give him one. Uh, I mean, he's been on the Calipari, anti Calipari corner for as long as I've been listening to him. And the fact of the matter is this he underachieved at Kentucky. No doubt. The, I mean, the, Patino had a six year run one title, three Final Fours, five Elite Eights in six years. Tubby Smith had an eight year run, and they didn't like him. Won a championship, made a Final Four, made four Elite Eights. Cal. It was awesome for 10 years and underachieved in those one championship, four final fours, seven elite eights, just the one ring. And the five years since then, they haven't even been to the Sweet 16. Mm-hmm. And so all the naysayers that were like great recruiter, not a great tactician, all that stuff. And I like Cal, and I've always kind of defended him. But it's an ignominious end. And if he doesn't get Arkansas back like to where it was with mm-hmm. Nolan Richardson, it's going to be like, wait, John Calipari ended his career where? It's going to feel weird. Uh, he'll like, come back around. The, I don't know, man. Yeah. He's getting it'll be like a, yeah, It'll be like a Patino thing. <laughs> Are the Cowboys out on Micah? Oh. Next on FS1 on the Fox Sports Channel on Sirius XF. Bruce going to give out another grade? No. Am I? I don't know. <laughs> okay, quick math. 
The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your product or service, the more margin you have and the more money you keep. Obvious. But with higher expenses on materials, employees, distribution, and borrowing, everything costs more. So, to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one platform and one source of truth. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware required accessed from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite. And you're improving efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move. So do the math. See how you'll profit with NetSuite. Now through April 15th, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to NetSuite.com slash FTF. NetSuite.com slash FTF. NetSuite.com slash FTF. Oh, welcome back to the Electric <laughs> Show. Drama in Dallas, question mark? Report from Sean Sharif that Micah has, quote, worn thin with the Cowboys. Trayvon Diggs responding with some tweets. Uh, who said that? And that's weird. <laughs> Shaking my head. Uh, Brew, is Micah part of the problem or the solution in Dallas? Uh, Wilds, all I got to say is this, or the first thing I have to say is I am so glad that unlike some people on this set, mm -hmm. I did not pick the Cowboys to win the NFC East. <laughs> I am so good because it's already, already? started. Oh, okay. Now, Micah is not a part of the problem. He is the solution. Oh, okay, we agree okay. there. So why are you going to take but, shots at well, me? Well, I'm just saying, there are, there are NFL predictions. Why is this happening? I got like, lost no, on that. No, but Nick's been singing the Cowboys' no, praises are you all bad? off season. No, I, on, he said the NFC East. Yeah, it's just, just that East. I don't believe in the Eagles because I don't believe in, what do you call it, an existential funk or something? <laughs> so, yeah. so supernatural. <laughs> supernatural, no, sorry. I mean – Micah, and you guys know, I, I'm not that big of a fan of him doing It's a great podcast, but is it? I think <laughs> yeah, it's fun for us. We get a ton of, 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 of ammo, ammunition I mean, from I it. Just... It's not the greatest thing for the team, sure. I don't think. A young guy who hasn't won yet, who's still building. It's not like he's Draymond Green, who's won rings and yeah. played his best basketball. Yeah, that's right. All right Travis so, and Jason. Yeah, even Paul George, yeah. who hadn't won, but he's a veteran Again, at least. these things. And so, yeah. I don't think that's great. But Micah, what is he? Other than I that? What, there's no problem. He doesn't have any character issues. He's not in, in the police blotter and things like that's that. That's exactly so, right. You know what I mean? Like, I think... You saw when when uh, D this is going way back when uh, Des Bryant was up for his contract. They, you know, you little stuff like this come out with Dak. Little stuff like this comes out. I, I think this is the Cowboys trying to get some leverage to maybe so, get the price down. Oh. From, and the fact that it's coming from a guy that interviews Jerry Jones every week on his radio show, one hundred five point three, just is going to lend credibility to the report. For Micah and for Trayvon Diggs and, and other Cowboys, they're going to oh, be like, it, it, he talks to Jerry every week. So, so he must know he's the, and even if he, he the, and I don't think Sean would say, I don't want to speak for him, uh, but that this came from Jerry, but he's connected to the team. Somebody he's been doing right. radio in Dallas for a dozen years, uh, that, Sean Sharif. And so I, I don't, I do believe his reporting. I think it is nonsense, though. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. I think what he's – I believe that he's – Someone yeah, said yeah, it, yeah, but yeah. they're wrong. But I think but that this he is – he, Micah Part – the reason pro football teams have these giant staffs of coaches and support people are to help the actual valuable employees mm -hmm. stay in the guardrails and make sure everything's all good. Yep. Because whenever you – in any field where you deal with – 20-something-year-old celebrity millionaires with wild talent, they might have some eccentricities yeah. that you have to manage. That's fine. That's part of the deal. Micah Parsons is the same age as Bo Nix, who's going to be coming into the draft this year. He's 24-year-old, best player on your yep. team. And the, he is, I agree with Brew entirely, like the, he on the podcast, it's kind of weird because you can argue doing the podcast shows not great judgment, but in when he does the podcast, he has shown amazing judgment because 
He does it every week during the season, solo, and he has said nothing. Right. Re- that, that's right. a big problem. Right. Yeah, trust me, we would have found it. We listened to that thing like a <laughs> like, damn congressional record. And so I just, I don't, I, I think sometimes, the, I agree with Brew, the Cowboys do have an organizational reputation for, you know, negotiating through the media. And I don't know if that's what this is or not. But then when we now get to this next story, who's their second best player, who doesn't have his contract yet, it kind of leads me to agreeing with Brew almost entirely. Just to kind of, this is a cop-out answer of both. Micah did on the podcast when he was with C.D. Lamb say that he needs to have more accountability. He lets things slide too often because we know we're good. That's about me. I want to change the culture. So, But that, that's, that's fine, and I think he's saying that as a player. Yeah. yeah and that's and fine. But o- overall, I mean, look, when they were winning championships, we know there were issues with that team. But so, to me, has worn thin is like, it, it, to me, that brings to mind, like, step on dig stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, oh, my God, this guy like... is just a pain in the ass in mm. the building. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to take a shot at Stephon, but that's clearly how the Bills felt about yeah. him. That's why they yeah. traded him. And I just don't get – I've never gotten that vibe or seen that, you know, like here's the bad thing Micah Parsons right. did. I've never seen it. If they got rid of him, which we know they won't, I, they're not, probably not even a playoff team. Well, yeah, he's the yeah. best player on their team. I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, on the offensive side of the ball, there's a report – that there might be a holdout looming for CeeDee Lamb. The dynamic wide receiver is on the final year of his rookie deal and may miss the voluntary spring workout, which by literal definition is voluntary. Uh, Cowboys social media team doing their part, however, saying, hey, happy birthday. Uh, Is this a sign, the holdout looming, not necessarily the social media post, post, that the Cowboys are in trouble? Well, here's where I think the Cowboys are in trouble. I have argued that they are a well-run team in regards to their drafting. I think yes, that they are. I think fair. they're good drafters, and I think that they are judicious in not splurging in free agency in ways that can really damage your team. Like people look at why the Chargers had to do a little tear down and why the Bills had to do a little tear down. You can kind of pinpoint impulsive free agent decisions, like mm-hmm. J.C. Jackson trading for Khalil Mack okay. or the yep. Von Miller deal. So the Cowboys have been good by not doing. So in that regards, I think they're well run. Where I think they are poorly run is not recognizing these are the guys we are going to have to pay. Paying them earlier is always better. The only guy they have paid early is the one guy they shouldn't have in Ezekiel Elliott because it's a position that you don't want to pay at all. But they waited as long as they could to pay Dak. Ended up paying him anyway, and that's what has now put them in this position where they can't tag him, they can't trade him, he has a massive cap hit. They could have paid CD a year ago. Mm -hmm. They didn't. Fine. I think their argument would be, well, Justin Jefferson didn't even get paid. Same draft class a year ago, so we'll wait. I'm telling you right now, though, Dallas, the price will – if you don't sign him before Brandon Ayuk signs, the price goes up. Because he's got to make more than Brandon Ayuk. And if you don't sign him before Justin Jefferson signs, the price goes up even though it won't be higher than Justin Jefferson because he'll say, okay, I want you know this right much there, less than right. Justin Jefferson. You're going to sign him. So, like, this is – I don't know what the weight is. I know why T. Higgins, same draft class, isn't signed. Because they're going to have to sign Jamar Chase, yeah. and they might not want to. You know what I mean? As right. good as T. Higgins is. You're going to sign him. The longer you wait, the more it costs you. That, to me, is an organizational mistake that they have consistently made. And, and I do – I agree with that. And I think it's, it'd be smart for CD to hold out. Because, like you said, they're going to cave. Is Zeke held out. And ultimately, Jerry caved. Go way back to Emmitt Smith. Hmm. He caved. You know, so I think, look, the voluntary workout – no That's need to go to out. that. Yeah, yeah d- don't, you know, risk injury. I mean, not that you're going to get hurt there, but don't risk that. And then if training camp starts and you don't have a deal, sit out. Because they absolutely, just like they need Micah, they absolutely need CD. Sure. And you're not going to be able to get a great read on Dak, theoretically, if CD's not there. So he's going to get signed, and if he holds out, to yeah. get more. Okay, coming up after the break, is Nick officially changing – his and is it a finals pick? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's embarrassing. Whatever. And what? Brew requested an olive branch as no, big as a tree. tree. I want an olive tree <laughs> out here. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in my lifeline. Check in on the Bucks, <clears throat> who lost again, this time to the Knicks by 14. Despite being under 500, with Doc, Giannis says 
They are not a losing team, but frustration is starting to take its toll on the Bucks, even off the court. Take a listen. When you go back home, you cannot uh, sit down and you know, watch Amazon uh, Prime and uh, be relaxed and, you know, uh, enjoy your steak and, I don't know, some guys drink, drink your wine or your beer, whatever they drink, I don't know. Uh, or, for my, my case, do my Legos. Now, when I try to put my Legos in place, I'm, like, more frustrated, you know, I'm, like, you know, hurt my fingers. Locked in. Uh, Nick, do you officially want to change your pick? Oh, no, bro. Okay. Okay. Can I ask, you guys, can I ask you guys a question? Yo, do not try it. Look this, what, okay, you asked me. Now let me go, please. I know, but you just did your whole like, weird and wonderful the, the tap dancing. <laughs> let me go, please. Did Giannis seem concerned? Not or did Giannis a, almost seem oddly calm and serene about what's happening? Because I know what you're thinking. What you're thinking is since we've last talked about the Bucks, they lost to Toronto. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, Dame didn't play in that game. And then they just lost to the Knicks with Giannis and Dame playing. And so this is four straight yeah, losses, three awful losses, and then the Knicks game is – Knicks are a good team, but they didn't play well in that Knicks right. game, they being Milwaukee. So how can you possibly believe in them? And the answer is you can't unless, of course – Don't say it. This is part of a plan. This is so weak. Okay, well, let me Not just – Not on your let part, me, but what? This, this is the let me just, I got to hear this. Okay, I, I don't know if you, Brew – have been locked into the, the Philadelphia 76ers, but I have been. They look awful scary. Yeah. They just got a great win without Embiid, and Embiid's playing great. And I don't know how, you, how closely you've been looking at the standings, but the Sixers are not going to be able to climb out of that play-in spot. They're going to be the seven. They're going to win that play-in game and end up staying the seven. So if you're Milwaukee, I'm just curious. I don't know. Would you rather be the two I mean, or would you rather fall so lame. to the three line because the NBA has not adopted pick your own opponent <laughs> in playoffs and because of that they are incentivized to lose, get the Pacers in round one. So, of course, I'd be a fool not to take your olive branch if I thought this was the real Milwaukee Bucks. But instead, they are doing the smart thing, which is ducking Losing Philly up. in oh. round one. Are you, are you buying ducking this? Ducking Philly in round it. one. I, I kind of buy it. Yeah, why how, would you want Philly in round one? one? Okay, That's well, I'm going to give Doc Call Rivers Lions, Giannis then, Dame more credit than that. They are not cowards. It's you can't about, control it anyway. What do you mean? You don't know where you're going to end up. You do. No, you lose they, and you go fall. What's this to stop Cleveland or Orlando or any of the Knicks? Any you of these teams play, are thinking that. You play Orlando twice. So you Orlando lose. could think the same that, thing and we'll lose. Orlando's no. young and dumb. No. They're just going to win. You like, oh, play, look at us for a two seed. You play who's in front. In fact, honestly, look, I agree that Philly's dangerous. Dangerous. And if Philly gets Milwaukee in round one, Right now, Philly's gonna I'm win. taking the six. Yeah, agreed. Right. That's but, why you got to get away from But them. don't you think the best time to play the Sixers, if you have to face them, would probably be early? No. Because no. you, you don't want I, – I think – Yeah, you don't want NBA's, him being back Yeah, in the flow. he's still kind of – I mean, well, I don't want to play the Sixers at all. I don't want to play them at all. Hey, hold on. Be honest, bro. It's a smart strategy. No, it's not. That, it's a horrible you know. strategy. Can I show you? Uh, Bucks 15 is 17. Under Doc yeah. Rivers, and this hasn't. This isn't recent. This is pre All Star. Uh, so when did they start this plan exactly? Two weeks ago. In your mind, you're okay. <laughs> then Doc is executing it perfectly. You yeah. should change. You should change the should uh, picture smiling. into a happy one. And you know what he also did? This is just you know, I don't respect it. No, I don't like it, but I respect it. Bucks host the Celtics tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Either way, he gets to come out and be like, told you. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> told you. They lost. I told you. Working exactly. Oh, they won. Told you. They can hey, beat anybody. Hey, Wilds, Wilds, I don't appreciate you implying to the audience that I'm strategically planning out my takes like that. I'm telling. I'm, I, I did a deep dive into the tiebreakers and the standings. Okay. I realized <laughs> Philly's not going to be able to What are you Indiana. rooting for tomorrow night, Buck Celtics? What do you hope happens? Oh, he's the Celtics are going to win. The Celtics are going to – Philly's going to lose I – mean, Milwaukee's going to lose to Boston and then Orlando and then maybe get it together right before – and it's like, oh, man. What, well, that was a weird two-week and, funk and, Milwaukee. And you know, now only, they need the Pacers. Not only do one. they need to avoid Philly, mm-hmm. your Heat. Well, they heat. culture in the first round. Well, no, they should avoid everyone. Be the eight seed. Well, they should we'll try see. to fall. Tomorrow, how is the <clears> freshest <throat> segment in all sports? And everybody's happy except LeBron. 
and the mountain is named after him. That's probably how he got sick. Almost there. <laughs> it's King of the Hill tomorrow, 4 o'clock. First look at Stefan as a Texan. He's got a brand new helmet, or the same helmet with different decals. Uh, details emerging from the Buffalo Bills' busy offseason of saying goodbye to talented players. Chris Sims reporting that there was one team that the Bills brass wasn't interested in seeing Stefan suit up for. Take a listen. And from what I do know, right, is that he was allowed to seek a trade from anybody in the league except the Kansas City Chiefs, Mike. That, that, that's what I've, I've wow. been told by multiple people, that he was allowed to do that. Wow. The Chiefs were the only team they weren't going to trade for him. Missed out. <laughs> uh, so, listen, at first you want to give the Bills credit. Or you want to cut them slack, I should say. Because... I, I wasn't able. Baseball reference doesn't track this far enough transactions 100 years ago. Yeah. But I imagine it was quite some time after trading Babe Ruth to the Yankees for the Red Sox to do another deal with the Yankees. <laughs> and we should remember that the Bills made the modern-day Babe Ruth trade when they traded, and we can show you the details of it, Patrick We're Mahomes to the Kansas to City the Chiefs. Modern day Babe okay, Ruth. well, I don't know. You traded away the greatest player ever. <laughs> At least the Red Sox were able to put on a play. <laughs> uh, the Bills got nothing out of it. They got in tickets to the Arrowhead Invitational a couple times, and that's it. So initially, you want to cut them some slack for that. But then reality must set in, and you have to recognize this, Brew. The Bills have held on to a belief that their biggest competition is Kansas City, but they're not in the Chiefs' weight class anymore, if they ever were. And instead, they strengthened <clears throat> someone who actually is in their line thing. of sight, the Houston Texans. Pretending that they are still competing with the Chiefs, they strengthened a team <laughs> that is now actually take. competing with them for the opportunity to lose to the Chiefs. And so if, if it was, you can, we, we'll trade you anywhere in the NFC. Right. Again, I think you should just take the best deal available to you. But Even we, if it came from the Chiefs. Yes, because I, I, especially in this regard. Let me add one other piece to it. The Bills gave up a fifth and a sixth in Stephon Diggs for a second-round pick. They lost cap room. The only reason to do that is because you think he is treacherous in the locker room, a divisive force, poison. Wouldn't you want to infect the Chiefs with that? Shouldn't that have been, hey, buddy, we'll only send you to Kansas City. <laughs> Work out the trade. Go ruin their locker room like you ruined ours. None of it makes sense. No, you but... think he's a toxic asset. <laughs> you listen, you are so awful, we will eat cap dead, the biggest dead cap hit of any non-quarterback ever and get minimal return 15 months from now to get rid of you. But... We won't send you to the team we're trying to beat. Doesn't make sense. Make it make sense, it, Buffalo. It's a nice, it's a nice take. It's, it's the correct <laughs> it's, take. It's kind of like your Bucks take. It's, it, oh, wow, that's creative that he thought of that. <laughs> but it's not true. All right, that, that's the thing. It is true. I mean, first of all, Diggs wasn't bad when he first got to Buffalo, right? So they know he won't be bad. If he, go, if he went to Kansas City, he would be on his best behavior. I think he will in Houston, too. But, look, Nick, mm -hmm. there was, they did the right thing. And I get it. The Houston take was fair. That, that's pretty good. But they're like, look, all we got to do is win our division. And then we'll worry about the playoffs, Houston and, and Cincinnati and these other teams. You cannot send a receiver. And Pittsburgh did it. Deontay Johnson, they wouldn't send him to Kansas City. What was Pittsburgh? No, Pittsburgh I, was even any team in the AFC should not be strengthening the, the Chiefs. They're looking at the Chiefs and saying – they had one weakness last year. It was wide receiver. They still won the Super Bowl. The Steelers Why won what a are, what are the Chiefs going to be if they get a receiver All like right, Stephon Diggs? Let me ask you They'll be question. unbeatable. But, but, where does, but where does the line go? If the story came out that the Patriots were unwilling to trade with the Chiefs, would you consider that delusional? No, because the Patriots aren't. Right. They're in the drive so you, for right. five. Well, so, but the Bills are going <laughs> – Bills will still – could be likely to be in the playoffs. Okay. They're still likely yeah, to be in the playoffs, and who knows when they'll meet the Chiefs. Right, but the, the, you don't want to strengthen the, the Chiefs. But instead you strengthened the team. It, so it's if you think, at, first of all, I would argue, if you think Stefan Diggs strengthens a team, then you should have fixed the relationship. I agree. That's the well, first take. The, the second tried. one is this. 
Are you really, though, in more competition with the Chiefs or with the Texans? I think that's fair. Because I think you that's, are in closer th- competition with the Texans point, but than you are the Chiefs. There is no way Patrick Mahomes with a great receiver with this defense – how you beating them? Well, the, well, the problem. So is, ultimately, even if the Texans are a competition, ultimately you got to get by the Chiefs. And so there's no way if I'm any team in the AFC that's like comp, you know, pretty good. I'm starting I'm not, to think this collusion because any great NFC any. team also shouldn't trade with the Chiefs. Then right? Uh, we got no way to trade with. Yeah, they, we're too good. I, Duff, if I was any, good, honestly, though, no, Nick, if I was any team in the league, I would not be making a trade that's going to make the Chiefs better. Everybody's I would not so scared. send a great team Go player compete. to the Chiefs. Yeah. Everybody's no scared to compete. Way. Ooh, Patriots. Well, how about, what about Rough winning five. the trade? What about making a trade that you get the better end of? How about that? What about swindling somebody? Live from Union. In pro, live, where we? <laughs> that eclipse really rocked your world. Oh my gosh, huh? between that and the earthquake, I'm all <laughs> shaken up. And the Yukon Huskies. Dusty, how are you feeling? <laughs> Uh, a little bit rough. It's the second it's hour. First things first. Today, Bronny declares for the draft. Does this does this mean LeBron's tenure with the Lakers is coming to a close? Perhaps. Meanwhile, is UConn on upset alert? The answer to that is no. Although Dusty and I are betting several boxes of crumble cookies, bro. Wow. Really? Are you serious? LeBron's <laughs> so excited. Wow. But right now, we are 17 I days away excited. from the NFL draft. Wow. And Nick has another edition of his mock draft, this time listening to my protests that demand, spoiler alert, that the Patriots draft Jaden Daniels at three. But without further ado, here's one to 32. Take it away. All right, so this draft involves a pre-draft trade in the mock draft (coughs) thanks to a pre-draft trade in real life. So the Buffalo Bills traded away Stephon Diggs, which means the Bills at 28 are almost assuredly drafting a wide receiver there. The Lions sitting at 29 were projected to draft a wide receiver, but now they're like, oh, are we going to have to take wide receiver six at 29? Why don't we do this? Trade the 29th pick for T. Higgins. Oh, I like so that. in this draft, the, okay. the Lions trade their first round pick and then sign T. Higgins to the contract extension he wants. So that consider that going into this as the Bengals have what lost T. Higgins. What are the Bengals getting? What, the 29th pick. Oh, 20, okay. They're getting the 29th pick, and then you'll see what they're doing in okay. the draft. All right, first eight picks of the draft. Wild's correct wow, that uh, Caleb Williams, Drake May, as it was last time. But this time with Jaden Daniels. Wilds guy going to the New England Patriots. The Cardinals send it in immediately with Marvin Harrison Jr. The Vikings trade up for J.J. McCarthy. More on that in a moment. The Giants get the most talented receiver they have had since Odell Beckham Jr. Shout out to Odell. Good to see him this weekend. Joe Alt hit the tackle for Tennessee. That is the most obvious pick of anyone in the draft. And then the Chargers, after trading down from five, trade back up to number eight. So oh. We'll give you the details on those trades right now. So the the Vikings trade 11 and 23 for number five. They'll probably, to be mm. honest, have to give up more than that. I went off the traditional trade value chart. My guess is that tra- that trade would involve some future picks. We don't have to worry about that for here. And then what do the Chargers do? The Chargers lost both of their receivers. They trade from 11, some late mm. round picks as well, to move up. So they get the third of the big three receivers, and the Falcons know they are going to draft defense. They are going to have their pick of almost any defensive player on the board at 8 or 11, so they can move down. Now to 9 through 16. At number 9, the Bears take an edge to go along Montez Sweat and Dallas Turner. The Jets in this draft are actually smart. Oh, They draft a tackle, one of the youngest players in the okay. draft to learn okay. under Tyron Smith. The, Vi- the Falcons still get their guy, Latu, the edge out of UCLA. And then the big trade. Brock Bowers. The Bengals trade up from 18. Those details in a moment to go get Ooh. Brock Bowers. The Raiders reunite Antonio Pierce and Michael Penix. The, or the I'm sorry, the Raiders get go get their quarterback. Don't reunite, pardon me. Michael, uh, Michael Penix Jr. The Saints, you heard Ryan Ramchek's worried. He might not be able to play this year. So all of a sudden, they desperately need a tackle. They get Fuaga. Everybody knows the culture taking the corner. They take the number one corner. And the Seahawks get a lineman that can play all five positions in Fatanu. And now we'll give you the details of the Bengals trade. So the Bengals lose Brock, lose T. Higgins. Mm-hmm. So they get, give up picks 18 and 49 to go get Brock Bowers. 
what some people consider the best tight end prospect, yeah. even better than Kyle Pitts in more than a decade. You re-sign Chase, you get Bowers on a rookie contract, and you don't really lose any juice in your offense. They obviously signed Gusecki. They can maybe go with some heavier sets, but also have Jamar Chase. Now, the latter half of the draft, fewer trades. The Jags get an edge to go along with Trayvon Walker and Jared Verse. The Broncos had traded down with Cincinnati because they wanted Bo Nix, and there was nobody that's going to draft a quarterback between 12 and 18 to take Bo Nix, so they were able to. The Rams do their best to replace the best defensive tackle ever with the best defensive tackle in this draft, uh, Byron Murphy the second. The Steelers, after trading away Deontay Johnson, they draft the 6'4 receiver at LSU and Brian Thomas yeah. Jr. The Dolphins lost defensive tackle Christian Wilkins. They get Johnny Newton from Illinois. The Eagles desperately need a corner, if you ask me. They get a corner. The Chargers, remember they have this pick from the earlier trade. They get a guy who's played right tackle at Alabama. Jim Harbaugh saw him up close and personal in the college football playoff. They have their left tackle. Now they have their right tackle. And the Cow- Graham Barton's probably a center or a guard. Cowboys need both. Now to the final eight of Mock Draft 2.0. The Packers, safety was their biggest weakness last year. They signed Xavier McKinney, and now they, sign, they draft the number one safety, turn a weakness into a strength. The Bucks had Devin White alongside Levante David as the core of that defense for years. Devin White left. Levante David was drafted in 2012. They try to rebuild that part of their team. The Cardinals get the freak athlete out of Iowa, Cooper Dejean. The Bills do get their wide receiver, 6'4", out of Texas, Adonai Mitchell, a transfer from Georgia. Didn't get used that much in Georgia. Was great at Texas last year. The Bengals, having received this pick from the earlier trade uh, for T. Higgins, they get their tackle that they've been looking for. The the Ravens get a tackle because they traded away their tackle to the Jets or lost them to the Jets. The Niners get a center, who they desperately need. Bruce, tell me how bad it was. And the Chiefs get a corner to replace LeJarrius Seed. And that is my draft 2.0, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of action there. All right, let's go back to the top of the draft here. Drake May to Washington. Now, Merrill Hodge just roasted. Went on the record and said, you know what? May's tape is going to get a coach fired. So, Brew, are you optimistic or pessimistic on Drake May? I like Merrill Hodge a lot. And, I, I look, I'm not going to go as far as to say Drake May's not going to be any good, but I would take Jaden Daniels. And I think oh, Nick wow. did this to appease you. Yeah, thank you. So he could go to the Patriots. But we know that May has the, the strong arm, but a lot of people are feeling like he needs to sit a, a year a la Jordan Love, but only for one season before he starts. We know that, that'd that be good. I think that's good for most quarterbacks, but I think he may need it more than most. And Jaden Daniels, I mean, we know the athleticism is off the charts. We know that in addition to that, he's got great pocket presence. Like, I know he's got to improve, you know, in his intermediate passing a little bit, but he throws a great deep ball. Mm-hmm. And I just think he, Wilds, I think he's what you guys need. You won't get him, but I think he's what Washington needs. I would go with Daniels at, sec- at so, two. And I know we're going to talk more Daniels in a minute. I the, Here's the, the best argument for Drake May that the people who believe in Drake May keep bringing up, and it seems simplistic, but I think it is a fair one, is – what do you think Drake May would look like in college football two years from now? Because that's what we saw from Jaden and Penix. Okay. We saw them two years older than Drake May yep. is now with two more years of reps. And so the Drake May, not this past season, but the season before, looked awesome. This season had some inconsistencies. Also, last year, last season, the season before this past one, had more weapons. This year, they're probably the only other... North Carolina offensive player that's going to get drafted is Tez Walker probably in the third or fourth round. But I just, I I think because of the age and the upside there, I would be very surprised if, go ahead. If Washington doesn't go with Yeah, this is not just to appease Wilds. The the appeasing Wilds is that the Patriots draft Jaden, not JJ. I do think it's going to go as of now, Caleb and then Drake May, but maybe I'll be wrong. I just think people like the upside of that. They had to get Sam Howell out of Washington. Yes. Too much of an alpha. I I, I, yeah, you you sent us that tweet and read it aloud <laughs> to the entire office. I like yeah. Sam Howell. Uh, Jaden Daniels, finally, back to three for the Patriots. Sleeper team who are on a drive for five, five wins. Uh, Brew, you just talked about how much you like Jaden Daniels, but kind of take your lens and point it at the Patriots. 
do you think the Patriots can get to five wins since we're on the drive for that's, five? No, that's, <laughs> that's not the question. Why, you make it up. Relevant. That's, relevant is five wins. He would make them relevant because we'd want to see what Daniels looks like there. Now, and the defense, let's just say the defense is good. Now you got a quarterback who even though he, we know he's polished in the pocket in college, but he's going to have some growing pains. Sure. But when, as he's going through his growing pains, he can make things happen off schedule. Thank he can you. run. So it would be exciting. You, we'd all want to tune in and see what Jaden Daniels looks like for the Patriots. So, yes, it would make you guys relevant. Love. For good and for bad, this just has so many RG3 similarities, which is a guy who going into his final year of college football was nowhere near the top of anybody's mock draft, mm. has a monster, you know, last year, wins the Heisman. Jaden obviously doing it with far more weapons than yeah. uh, than RG3. But RG3 had good receivers that year at uh, Baylor, but also real concerns about his body. And for RG3, listen, maybe it was just the one hit and then, they, you know, he got left in the game. I don't Seems know. Like but I – were you an I, elbow truther? But no, don't, I don't care about the, the burst of sack on his elbow. I care about the fact that he weighs 22 pounds more than I do. But yeah, don't I care you, about wouldn't that. you, I think oh, obviously I, he's a tall guy. You would think he could put on a little bit of weight. And some I, comps have him like Kyler Murray, I, but he's 6'4". Yeah, but Kyler like, I'd rather you be thick, I, man. I get that, but I'd rather a guy be taller than, and a little bit thinner. Can thin. I say something okay. about guys when yeah. people say they can put on weight? I don't. Yeah. Then you would have. Yeah. He's twenty, like he's in his, or like he's five years of college football. I don't he, think he, he has his man the, body yet. The, what, what, when's it coming? It's coming soon. No, I mean, it's coming it? soon. Twenty-four, twenty-five. Oh, yeah, couple of years sure. in the league. Uh, <laughs> Chargers at eight, taking Roma Dunze from Washington. College career saw him rack up Whoa. over three thousand yards and twenty-four touchdowns. Brew, do you see him as Herbert's immediately uh, I, wide receiver? I actually do. I, yeah. We know how strong the draft is for receivers. Some think. He's second. I mean, a couple may be saying even first in his draft as far as a receiver. But I like his size. He runs a 4 4 40, so he's got speed to go with the size. And you look at a lot of the guys, I mean, an A.J. Brown, a Debo Samuel. He's a strong receiver, so he, those guys can run after the catch, make something happen. I think he could be that type of guy. And you look in the last several drafts, there's been at least one great receiver and and in many of these drafts a few oh, yeah. really good receivers so yeah if he's at near the top of this draft as a receiver i believe he's going to come out there and produce oh listen i the people i think people have overstated the great wide receivers in this draft being deep i think that there are a lot of potential wide receiver twos in this draft i think the, the late first and the entire second round you're going to have guys going Throughout it, from Ladd McConkey, Purcell from Florida, right. Xavier Worthy, the guys who I had going late first round. But to me, there are three clear day one wide receiver ones, and they are all going to be top ten picks. Mm -hmm. And for the Chargers, they missed on Quentin Johnston flat. Like I yeah. just, they they just missed on him. I don't think all of a sudden he's going to be excellent. And so this would be, uh, this would be a great kind of help to Justin Herbert and a guy who would be cheap. Yep. And this is a guy Harbaugh, by the way, played against the national championship game. So, so I he, and, uh, he, and he's not going to get past the Bears. Scott Scott not. You're right. not giving Harbaugh a lot of uh, recruiting credit here. Well, I think he's draft, draft, draft prep credit. I think it's like, oh, I saw this guy in the national championship. Let me get him. Well, I think if you know their problems, then uh, yeah. That's, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, you draft, got the, draft your own players in the second and third round. <laughs> Bengals grabbing uh, Georgia tight end Brock Bowers at 12 after trading T. Higgins. Uh, Brew, do you like this point? But look, you guys know I've said you don't have to trade T. All right, you could play him this year and, and go for it. But if you know you're, if he's going to be unhappy, I think he still would play. But if he's going to be unhappy, and obviously you'd lose him for very little if you lose him in the, after next season. So if you can get Bowers and then you run a lot of 12 personnel, you still got, you know, Jamar on the outside. Like, your passing game would still be very strong, presumably. So I don't hate this one. Now, that's getting a, a late first yeah. for T, which some people aren't sure they're going to be able to get Correct. that. And with this drive being so deep with receivers, does a team say, hey, I can get a really good receiver, a Cheap. number two guy for cheaper? So I, if they can get a late first, then, yeah, i do it, but I don't know if they'll be able to. I think Bowers is the most likely non-quarterback that someone will trade up for. Oh. Because I think that 
there, I, I, I've done literally 70 mock drafts uh, because it's just like just I, I just enjoy the different machinations of it. And uh, unless the Jets do the impulsive thing at and take Bowers at 10, the people that cover the Bears swear they're not going tight end at nine. It's hard to see Bowers going in the top 10. And then you wonder if there's going to be a team that says we have him rated as the fifth best player in the draft. Right. Yep. They trade up. So, you know what I mean? 11, 12, 13. So, if it's not Cincinnati, I think someone will trade up for Brock Bowers. Okay. Coming up next, Bronny declares mm. for the NBA draft. What does that mean for LeBron next? That PFF mock draft spot. So Bronny there. James declaring for the NBA draft, but also keeping his college eligibility as he entered the transfer portal. Made his college debut in December after recovering from a cardiac arrest. On the year, Bronny averaged five points, three rebounds, and two assists. Brew, your reaction? Well, when I first heard the story, I was like, I was, a, a, to be honest, disappointed, a bit sad, because I was like, he, he's not ready. Obviously, you just gave his numbers, and the team wasn't even that good. But then when you look at what they want to do, have him go work out for NBA teams, interview with NBA teams, and obviously, not only is LeBron got his back, but Rich Paul's arguably the most powerful agent in the game. So they want to find if, if a team has a program for Bronny. And I know that sounds like program. We got 15 players. No, a program for Bronny where you're going to help him develop into or at least try to develop into an NBA player. I think LeBron and, and Rich Paul's view is he's, his best chance of growing into an NBA player is to work with an NBA team yeah. during practice, et cetera, rather than playing with a college team. Okay. And so I think that's a good plan. And if a team is willing to do it, then you, he gets drafted. If not, then he can go back and play in college. I think the Lakers are going to draft him. I think uh -oh. the La they clearly want to keep LeBron. I think the Lakers will draft him. Mm. They, they got a second-round pick. Can they, from the Clippers, will he be there? I assume so. So I think the Lakers will draft him. So here, listen, I, people can argue about the fairness or righteousness of this, but there is another element to it as well, which is – there is, and I've described this before, but I don't know if I've ever described it exactly right. If there is a belief that LeBron James Jr., that Bronny could be a legitimate NBA player three years from now, but the only way that he would be that is if there is a legitimate NBA program and investment in his development, right. then LeBron, using the levers of power, to try to get a team to be invested in his kid is quite simply how businesses across America have operated in a dozen in dozens of fields forever. And including and professional it, sports. Including Look at the professional sports, throughout the right. professional sports. Right. Especially in front offices or coaching staff. Absolutely. But by the way, J.R. Smith had enough power to get Chris yep. on an NBA <laughs> team. And I think the one of the Giannis reasons in I, Giannis' his whole family gets to try. Right. And I think one of the reasons Seth Curry got as he long of a release player, as though. he did to where he then became an excellent player was because people wanted to do right by Steph. And so here, the Lakers thing is interesting. But here's the question I've asked for and I'll ask again. Because LeBron is a potential free agent this offseason. Would, would it be smart for the New York Knicks, for instance, to trade the 25th pick of the draft, a first-round pick, if that's where they ended up being, for LeBron James? I would say yes. I would say LeBron James, even in year 22 at age 40, is worth a late first-round pick yes, if it were a one-for-one one trade. 100%. Here, here. Yes, and so my point is, Brew, would a team then say, if Bron says, I'll sign with you, if you, dra if you have the 25th pick of the draft, if you draft Bronny, I will sign with you. I'm going to give you a few teams Weird, ahead of the Knicks because that, that makes some sense. I don't know that LeBron going there, and you could even get a trade. You, they probably send Julius Randle. You but know, you wouldn't have him. to. He's a free agent. But, but sure. if you want, if, yeah, yeah, sign and trade, whatever. But, look, if Milwaukee goes out in the first round, why not try to get LeBron? I don't know if they right. – Now, would he take, would he take the minimum? Sure. Right. But Philadelphia, if they, they don't go one. deep. So that's a great – LeBron one. in Philadelphia, and they got the money to actually and pay they, him the max. Yeah. We talked about Paul George going there. I'd rather have LeBron. So if they so with that group, like, is that not you don't like that? You don't. No, I I think what you said makes a lot of sense, but it, 
I'd be lying if I told you it didn't leave a sour taste in my well, mouth. Well, I mean, I'm not trying to be like, like, listen. Tell us why. I, I want to live in the, the nepotism. Well, I want to. I, I get it. Live in the real world. Thanasis is on the team, and there's value to that. That goes beyond the stat sheet. But I wonder where the line is of like, yeah, he's here to develop. It's like, all right, hey, can he get some run against? Well, you know, that's the, that's the a decent. So now all of a sudden it's like, oh, he's getting. We're like doing developmental stuff. No, I that's a good point year. in that if LeBron can get a team to draft him, can he get a team to play him when he isn't ready to play? Well, but I, and that's where you could call. I don't know. But if you know, right, no, I get that. But I, I think you could. He, he could even be in the G League, like first, like the Lakers' first round pick right now. You know what I mean? It's been time he, in the G League. Uh, okay, is that part of the and plan? That, and would so I, would I just I think plan? it is. And again, this comes from someone who I host my podcast with my son, and so like I understand <laughs> the idea of like, hey, I have a bit of juice here, and I want to use it to, you know what I mean, to help my family and out. Here's like, the I get one it. difference, though, and and you're right, it happens all the time in corporate America in the front office. The difference is they're not seeing. We would be seeing Bronny play a lot, you know, eventually. And he's be would be scrutinized That's true. by people all over the world if he's not ready. That's the difference in corporate America. I bet he comes back being to on the court. play for somebody. Really? Yeah. Well, that's I think thing. an NBA team will put that plan together. You do? I, do. I wonder if the plan is better than a plan that uh, UFL medals time. Yep. Okay. So this was my favorite. But uh, you have Great three catch. other ones. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just excited for no, you. I'm, I'm sorry. Time. This is the greatest one-handed catch. They're already saying catch of the year. Well, I was I, in the league. In yeah, the, well, I mean, it's only it's, been, it's early in the year, but I think it is the UFL. catch of the year. UFL. Former second-round pick for the Dallas Cowboys, Taco Charlton, hat trick of sacks, and a win over the Panthers. Shout out Taco. He gets the bronze, silver medal. Marcel Aitman, four catches, two touchdowns, 114 yards, and a win over the Renegades. Heard the Bills might have called him shortly after the game. Can't confirm. <laughs> Gold medal for the Brahmas. Chase Garber's former NFL quarterback, 29 of 40, three touchdowns. This win included fourth and 12 instead of the onside kick. Go for Ooh. it. Pick it up. Touchdown drive in the final 48 See? seconds for the Brahmas. There is the podium from this weekend in the UFL. Sorry for stepping on you, Wild. No, it's okay. Uh, Purdue, UConn tonight. Crumble cookies on the line. Dusty. Uh, I have an announcement to make. If UConn wins, I will bring celebratory crumble cookies. And if UConn loses, I will also bring crumble cookies and claim them from Dusty. So Brew can't lose. Can't right, lose. I'm, I'm good. So who are you rooting for, Brew? Crumble cookies not oh, Gosh. That's a, that's a good... I pick UConn. That was my... I got, I got to be honest. I wouldn't mind seeing the upset. I I, I'm going to go. I, I, Dusty was so melancholy today. I'd like to see Dusty smile. So I want to He's so mad. He's out there just heckling us. I was going to ask Dusty to come on so everyone could see his gorgeous Purdue sweater. Dusty, you want to come I realized on? it was against <laughs> union regulations. Come on, Dust. Uh, Purdue wins. Really? UConn wins by 12. UConn wins by 12. You've been right about it the whole time? For two years. Zach Eady with a 38-18. Speak up next. <laughs>